All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, today we have Adora Chung. She's a YC partner and co-founder of HomeJoy. Thank you. How's, How's it going? going? Good. How are you? <laughs> Good. Uh, all right. We're going to do some office hours questions from the internet. Uh, so let's go. Cool. So first question is from Topher Peterson. And he asks, how many users did you have when you applied to YC? And also, how much revenue had you generated? So when we applied to YC back in 2010, we were a company called, at that time, Pathjoy, not okay. Homejoy. And we were a marketplace for online services. So we we're trying to bring on typically offline services like tutoring, uh, life coaching, therapy, and all these legal services online. Um, and our thesis was this was, re- this was the time to put it to video and, um, and we would be the ones to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we applied, if I remember correctly, we had onboarded a lot of people for the supply side of stuff, so service providers, um, but had onboarded absolutely no one yet on the demand side. So we had obviously generated no revenue yet, um, but uh, that's what we had when we okay. applied. And this was 2010? 2010. Okay. And had you started a company before? No, I had previously worked at a company called Slide, and we and I ran product there, and we built Facebook apps. The develop uh, I started in two thousand seven when the Facebook developer platform just, just launched. Okay, and what made you want to start a startup? I think I've always knew that um, I wanted to create stuff, yeah. and make stuff for the world, um, and it just was a matter of finding the right idea. Okay, and so after a couple of years at Slide, I decided it was the right timing also because my brother who would be my co-founder yeah. had just graduated college and i said hey you should just come out here <laughs> let's work on stuff so we started working on stuff did you uh did you have any like i don't know apprehension about starting a company with your brother not really i think it's funny because my brother and i grew up kind of in separate worlds um so it's not like we were uh together all the time or yeah. we knew each other's uh if we were compatible working together. So it was a little of a trial and error in the beginning. Um, but having a sibling, working with a sibling, you know you can trust them and they're not going to do anything horrible to you. Yeah. And so I think there was just that initial layer of trust that was okay. pretty good for us. Yeah. And also, I guess you were out here for only a couple of years, so you didn't totally have a network either. Exactly. Right. Yep. Yeah. So makes sense. Cool. Uh, all right. Next question. Uh, Hotly asks, how do you keep going if you can't raise any money? So... Uh, you just have to keep your personal burn really low. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say just from experience where uh, my brother and I weren't able to raise much money um, for two and a half, almost three years. And we were just able to just keep going in terms of trying to find users and stuff like that. You just got to be incredibly scrappy because obviously you can't afford to acquire any users. Um, so which means, which is actually a good thing because it forces you to get out of your chair and you have to go talk to users because it's the only way mm-hmm. that you can um, get them to use your product. Um, and and I think it's, I think going through a period of not having enough cash to work in your startup gives helps you develop a lean mentality, which is good to keep um, moving forward if you if and when you raise money. Mm-hmm. Did, had you raised before YC? No, we hadn't. Okay, and then you raised like a hundred. Yeah, we raised a hundred k around demo day. Yeah. Um, and then use that for the next two and a half years. Hmm. That's kind of, that's amazing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was your own employees, just the two of you? Uh, it was just the two of us. We, yeah, it was just the two of us. Wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, the, it, it was uh, cheap to live in Mountain View at that point, so it wasn't. Really? Yeah, well, that's cheap funny. relative. Uh, around that time, it was about 900 bucks a month. Okay. For like a one bedroom and bath apartment. So you took so. the Y. How much was the YC money at the time? It was, I believe we got 15K. <laughs> so Each or total? Total. Total. Okay. Um, and then we raised 100K from someone else. And you made that last for two years? Two and a half years, yeah. Two and a half yeah. years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Impressive. <laughs> Just didn't do much besides work on a startup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there's another question that's like further down the list, but somewhat related to, you know, keeping going or quitting. Um so Alejandro Ruperti asks, how or when do you decide to walk away from something that you started? Um, so that's a tough question. I think when you, I'm assuming he means the startup or an idea that you're yeah. working on. Um, I think this is one of the things you actually have to think about before you start, um, which is, okay, great. This is an idea. Maybe you got some users, so on and so forth. Before you even even think about raising money um, or hi- especially hiring people, 
you should really think about, is this something you want to do for the next five, six, seven, ten years? Um, because success is way down the road. Um, and I think if you can't imagine yourself doing that, then that's not something you should jump into. Mm -hmm. um, but if it is, then certainly you should go for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think during your journey, your startup journey, if you ever start questioning yourself of, am I, am I, you know, am I in, in the quote unquote right game or not? Um, then yeah, it, I think it's important to always zoom out and reevaluate. Um, but I wouldn't be doing it in the corner by yourself. I would always find a set of friends, um, in the startup world, but also outside of the startup world to give you some that perspective. Um, and if that doesn't help, you know, you can always uh, find a, a coach to help you talk through that. Um, and and then if you do have, if you have raised money or you have employees, you do have responsibility um, to them or to your investors as well as to your employees, um, which is not to say keep going because of that, but it's just to say you need to find a transitionary um, role or period in which um, you take care of all those mm. duties. Did you struggle with that at HomeJoy? No, I think we, no, I, not not in particular. Um, I think I just um, kept on going. I think there were times where we were like, are we right, working on the right idea or not? Um, Aaron and I, my brother, who's my co-founder, we pivoted a dozen times before we got to HomeJoy. And so, um, uh, which was helpful. We pivot. The fact that we pivoted that much um, yeah. was helpful in the sense that we were we learned how to push product out very very fast, um, which was helpful when we finally got to the right idea. Um, but certainly, every when you're when each time you pivot, you sort of just think maybe maybe two more weeks, maybe there's one more feature, <laughs> maybe you know maybe if I just got one more user and things will take off. Mm. Um, and so you just have to step back and and always reevaluate um, that. How did you pivot 12? Because like where you ended up from the initial application isn't that far. Did you like... Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we started with Marketplace for online services. And then yeah. <laughs> it was just Marketplace for an offline service. Right. Uh, starting with cleaning and then eventually some other home services. Um, yeah, I, I don't... I, I, I don't know if... I'm not sure if um, that pathway could have been shortened or not. Okay. I do think we learned a lot along the way in terms of working with each other um, that really helped us take, make that take off at the time that we came to it. Do you remember what you did in between? Like, was there anything that was just like objectively crazy or terrible? Um, there were a lot of terrible things. I mean, I, I think I, we also built, at least I built over engineer a lot of things because um, I thought it was cool to build yeah. some stuff. Um so after I'm not going to remember all of them, but um, Pathway it was a it was trying to connect service providers with clients. Um, when that didn't start working out, uh, when we couldn't find enough clients for the service providers, we had all these service providers. So we started. We're like, what can we do with all these service providers? <laughs> um, well, they still needed clients, and we thought, okay, what if they just um, we just made it into Q and A site? So we had a Q and A site Q and A site for a while. After a while, I think a lot of the service providers um, got a little tired of just creating free, essentially free content. Oh, they weren't getting paid. Okay. Yeah, they weren't getting paid for it. It was um, I mean, sort of kind of the pitch was if you write all this content, then it'll help you develop your brand. Right. It's and like then here's marketing. a profile. Yeah, yeah marketing. Um, and then it rolled into a bunch of content sites, and then um, and then it turned into basically. Um, like a demand media type play. And we weren't just, uh, I think by the time we rolled into that, we're just like, this is not going to be huge and we're not really into this. So um, let's just rethink the whole thing. Yeah. Oh, to go back to your other ideas, uh, you said you applied with like a Twitch type idea as well, right? No. Yeah. So on my application, I just reread it. Uh, yeah. I applied with the marketplace for online services, but there's a question on there which <laughs> says your other ideas. And my other idea literally is Twitch, um, which is not to say that I made a mistake to not build it because I'm not quite sure I would have made that a huge thing. Yeah. It's just that it was just kind of funny f for me to see that. You literally just wrote like video game streaming. No, it was um, just watching people play games and checking in and um, commenting and doing all these things, um, kind of like ESPN for games, essentially. And the reason how I came up with the idea was because I was always watching my brother play games, and he would also then go on YouTube and watch other people play games. For sure. And I'm just like, that's so weird to me, but 
he was doing it and like a bunch of other people were doing it. I was like, okay, there's something here. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I, the thing is, I think I'm not really into games that much. And so I, I'm not quite sure that would have, I'm pretty so confident it wouldn't have worked out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it may have been a little early as well. Like, At that point. Yeah. yeah. Live streaming was, yeah. Yeah. Not there yet. Cool. All right. Let's go to the next question. Um, Chris Melnick McDonald asks, what advice and lessons did you learn in entering the Canadian market? So with the Canadian market, just like any other international market, um, there was the custom from the customer perspective, there wasn't that much of a difference on um, everyone. You know, you have a dirty home and you need to get it cleaned yeah. so on and so forth. Um, from the cleaning professional side, the service provider side, there was, there were some differences there in terms of, you know, where do you, where do people find jobs in the U S it's Craigslist and other places and other markets, it's something else. Um, so there are, there are those kind of differences that we had to learn about, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say they were super major. So there is how to acquire, um, service providers. Uh, there are maybe unique channels to acquire customers in each one of the local markets. Um, uh, there was things just like weather, um, traffic, like where are the traffic jams, public transit, how are people actually going to go from house to house and that had to be all baked into the scheduling stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, going back to the Canadian point, uh, it, it's not that there was nothing super special about Canada itself. Um, it's just, it's just the fact that it's another market that we went into. Mm. Um, and then we also launched in, uh, in the Europe as well, uh, Berlin, Paris, and London. Um, and similar to that, there were, there are some locale differences and obviously language differences as well. Yeah. Uh, but nothing super major. Uh, so yeah. What are your pro tips then? Like if, if I'm expanding to, I, I think Canada is like very close to the U S yes, but if I'm yeah. expanding to Europe, uh, what are your pro tips? Um, for that is I'd go, I'd go to the market and identify the opportunity first, go talk to potential users for us. We're a marketplace. So it had to be both sides yeah. of the users. Um, and there were some markets where we looked at, and I, I don't, can't recall exactly the right cities, but that we decided just not to enter because um, we didn't think there was enough demand or supply there for us, for us to make an impact. Um, but once you do that, then the other thing is if you're launching a, ton of these cities is to find somebody who's hopefully done this before. Mm -hmm. um, and we call them, what we call them was the uh, city launcher. And so this person would go into the market, find the first few customers, or sorry, find the first few service providers, first few clean, cleaning professionals. Um, and then we would match them with the customers and kind of, there was kind of like a manual back and forth going on to get the um, supply and demand running. Mm -hmm. And then they would find, and then if it worked out, then we would find a city manager. We would hire a full-time city manager to run the operations and be in charge of the PNL there. Um, and I think sort of that playbook that's been played out now. Um, and so a lot of startups have, have, uh, I think executed on this well. Um, so I think that's a pretty good framework. To okay. Go by. Okay, cool. Um, so another question related to kind of like getting started, uh, when you're, when you're small, uh, Yaha Elamrani asks, how do I work on culture or, or do I even work on culture in the very early stage when I'm just building a team and a product? Um, so the number one thing about working on a startup is finding the right co-founders yeah. and finding the right co finding your co-founder is pretty much setting the culture because it is, um, how you work with that person is going to parlay into probably how you work with other people. Um, so I don't think it's like you need a handbook and like write out your core values and all these <laughs> things. Um, right away. I think it's much more important to know if your startup is going to survive or not. So how do you get your users? Uh, how, how am I going to make my first buck? Um, I do think once you start hiring your first few employees, then that is an important time to try to figure out, to try to articulate that thing so that one, you're hiring the right people. Um, but two, there are some, ex like the people coming in yeah. have some expectation of how things are going to be run. How did you guys figure it out? Cause there's like, there's so much unspoken with siblings. Yes. And like, how do you yeah, <laughs> like, determine what what's part of the company culture and what's just like you guys? That's a good question. We wrote out our core values at some point. We had uh, five or six of them, um, and that's the way we that's the framework we chose, and which a lot of companies choose, I think. Um, but in the beginning, both of us would interview uh, everybody, mm -hmm. and then we would actively talk about it like is this the right person would they work with us well and so and so forth um and then go from there 
Okay. So kind of just like seeing if the person's a good fit rather than like explicitly writing all the values down yes. in the early days. In yeah. the early days. Yes. We eventually wrote all the values down. Um, but I think in the beginning we were just looking for smart people who were going to work hard, who, um, wanted to help cleaning professionals get work. Yeah. Um, and were into the mission of the company. Okay, cool. Um, so another home joy question, Adam Sanders asks, what was the best decision you made for HomeJoy? Um, so I think starting the company, obviously, um, I don't regret it at all. Um, yeah. We were able to bring on a great crew of people to work together. Um, and so what I uh, am most happy about and most pa- and was most passionate about was the fact that we created a platform that created work for people who um, needed the work, as well as um, did a service for people who um, uh, were busy and, and, you know, having a clean home is one of those things that it's hard to say, it's hard to articulate why, but when you have a clean home, you're just happier um, and you're more relaxed. Um, and so after a busy day of work, it's nice to be able to go home and just not mm. have to clean it. Um, so I think those two things, so starting that company, I'm, I'm proud of that. And, um, yeah, and like I said, I, I think our team was a great group of people who really cared and I would take nothing back to, um, for that. Yeah. Cool. Uh, next question. Ujawal Chah- Ch- Jahan asks, uh, would love to know what's the one thing, uh, she, you would do differently in hindsight if you were to start over again. And I think that's like home joy and life context. Yes. Um, So, oof. Okay. So with home joy, uh, there are so many things that I could have done a lot better. um, But if I had to aggregate a lot of them into kind of like one concept. Yeah, like a bucket. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, a bucket. It would be, um, I would have prioritized, um, I would have prioritized uh, union economics much earlier in our in in the uh, in our company. Mm-hmm. Um, so by that I mean when um, when you're building a marketplace, you're always in this constant battle of trying to figure out how to allocate resources between growth, user experience, and union economics. Um, and so what we did was we obviously we we heavily worked on all three of those things. But if you had to make me stack rank those three, mm-hmm. um, user experience and growth came before unique economics. Um, so this makes sense if and only really if there is one ample funding available and what I would think three other things. So one is um there are strong network effects. There are really strong network effects. Uh, or two, there are strong economies of scale. Mm-hmm. Or three, uh, there is a clear first mover advantage. Um, so one of those and ample funding or a combination of those um, last three that I said, mm-hmm. uh, no, strong network effects, uh, economies of scale, and um, first mover advantage. But in any case, um, in the cleaning space, it turns out that there are some of those um, there, but not to the extent of Uber or Airbnb. Yeah. Um, and which meant that we did have an opportunity in hindsight um, to have a much slower growth model and still maybe came out at top, uh, mm-hmm. on, uh, you know, winning um, in the long term. Um, and so, like I said, in hindsight, had I known about, um, had I foreseen what the dynamics, the funding dynamics would have been when we needed to raise money, um, I would have certainly made the decision to at least equalize and put equal effort into, you know, those three things, growth, user experience, and um, unique economics, yeah. if not had prioritized that much even higher. Um, when you're when you're advising YC companies, do you kind of have a rule of thumb? I mean, every company is different, but say there was a company similar to HomeJoy yes. saying like, you should be operating at like a whatever, like X percent margin to be in a good spot. Um, finding a particular, there's no constant margin you should be at. It, it's really dependent on the local market, I think, and the prices you can actually bear. Um, but I do emphasize unique economics and user experience above growth. I think 
Um, unless in some very odd scenario, which there are very few that, like I said, there are really strong yeah. network effects and that I think you can potentially raise a lot of money yeah. to just drive through some um, not so great unique economics. Um, but in general, uh, I don't think that's really the case. Yeah, those are usually the catastrophic failures. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, Nikita Budakov asks, what are some unique data science and machine learning challenges you faced at HomeJoy? Um, so I think some of the cool things we worked on, uh, well, there are a lot of things, but maybe I'll list three. <laughs> the top three, okay. the first three that come to my mind. Um, one is we had to create a lot of prediction models for uh, demand so that we knew how to how much supply to onboard um, so that supply and demand weren't out of whack. Mm -hmm. um, they're always, almost always out of equilibrium, out of whack, but you don't want it to be too, too much imbalanced. Um, another one we worked on is um, we did a lot of analysis on customers and finding out which kind of customers were the best for us in terms of uh, lifetime value. And so we figured out things like we should be targeting um, targeting uh, pet owners, for example. They were like 2 to 3x more valuable than regular, all things equal, than regular customers. Okay. Um, and then finally, one of the more difficult challenges um, was uh, scheduling. Um, when you have thousands and thousands of cleaning a day and you have preferences on both sides of the market mm -hmm. place, as well as things like transit, um, transit issues, and um, you don't want people traveling too far from one house to another and so on and so forth. Um, that was a difficult challenge that we hmm. did solve. Cool. Uh, next question. Alejandro Ruperti asks, uh, from Tim Ferriss, how has a failure or apparent failure set you up for a later success? I hope people mostly take failure to as a learning experience <laughs> um, and not to let it get you down, but but you should be uh, should be honest with yourself and, and know what you learned from it. And so, I mean, today I advise, I help a lot of startups out. Yeah. And so I think um, the previous things that didn't work out for me, it, it provides a really strong foundation and a basis of how I can help people. Um, but I always caveat that. And I, every time I help somebody, I always think, okay, what is the situation they're in? It never is going to be a copy and paste from my experiences. Right. Um, and so I, um, I always think about that first and foremost. And, and, and that's what I tell most people when they get advice from people, especially if they're going around to way too many people is that, um, like, you you are your own situation and you, and and people will give you potentially directionally correct advice but that's just directionally in the right direction right. not like <laughs> like i said it's not a complete one to one mapping yeah. um and so you always should be taking that into account yeah it's difficult and it, it messes with your confidence if you take advice from too many people yeah. especially when they're from all over the market like if i was starting a home joy type company now and i talked to you yeah. i think i would take your advice yeah. but just some random other startup founder is like why yeah, you know. Yeah, I know you must talk to so many founders that you yeah, must yeah. start uh, coming up with patterns in your head. Of I mean, that's like kind of the YC thing too, right? Yeah. It's like just pattern matching. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, so many of the like pieces of advice just sound trite after a while. Yes. Because it's tweetable, but in reality, <laughs> it's kind of like all about the nuance behind the scenes. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you can tell like. Culture is important or whatever. Yeah. Go talk uh, to users. There's exactly. so many ways to say that. <laughs> exactly. um, stop burning money so fast. Um, yeah, there's, there's. Yeah. And so all of these there. things are just like, at the end of the day, like you have to build the thing yourself and you have to have some confidence because like taste matters a lot in your company and your yes. product. And if you don't have your own opinion, like, I don't know how you're going to get through it. Yes, I agree. Um, which is, yeah, I mean, obviously you develop that. But over time, you're like, you're trying out 12, 13 different products before yeah. you get to like, <laughs> home try it. You, like, yeah. pivot around into it. Um, actually, I did, I did want to go back because yeah. this was about like, uh, so something, a failure for a later success. I wanted mm -hmm. to talk about you doing your PhD yes. as well. Um, cause I think it's also interesting to people who, yeah. yeah. Um, would you regard that as a failure? I would regard that not as a failure, but as time. Sometimes I wish I had that time to get back yeah. and I could have been working on creating things instead of, you know, um, creating, I don't know, economic models and uh, 
being a data monkey and tr- you know trying to do simulations and stuff like that on my all my fancy yeah fancy very academic models <laughs> um and so but um but yeah i i spent right after i graduated from undergrad um i you know i actually got a degree in computer science and didn't um i I come from South Carolina and yeah. there, um, for whatever reason, you know, that your choices are a little limited in terms of, um, what you're exposed to. So I was never exposed to Silicon Valley. I was never exposed to tech startups or any, any of these things. So, you know, by the time I was like 20, I just didn't even know that existed yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the thing I decided to do because I didn't want to work at a big company as a, code monkey was to go get a PhD in economics, which sounds weird, but I was, uh, I was doing some engineering work, uh, for an econ professor. And so I fell deeply in love with the idea of becoming an econ professor. <laughs> could be fun. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like I think it could be fun, but I generate a lot more meaning and value, um, doing what I'm doing today. Yeah. Value. Definitely. Meaning. I don't know. People like make their own meaning <laughs> Yeah, for me personally, but yeah. I am no qualms with people who decide to become econ professors. Right. Yeah. No, totally. Uh, question, not unless, uh, side projects. Are you building side projects right now to like keep that product, um, building, I don't know, gene muscle working. Yeah. I, um, started working I start, one, this is one of the things, because I'm not working a startup, I start a lot of things. I see something cool, and then I just, like, start working on it. Yeah. And then, um, but, so one of the things, I'm trying to build a DAP right now. Really? Um, yeah, on Ethereum. Uh-huh. Um, and just playing around with Solidity and all these things. Uh, we're starting to invest in a lot of the crypto blockchain startups now, and so I think it's really important that I truly understand how this stuff is built. Um, so I'm doing that, and... Um, Nothing else major besides that. But yeah. I'm always, I'm yeah. always like tinkering around with something. It's always tough. Like I have, a, I have the same itch, and I, I desperately only want to complete things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like I hate letting things like die on the vine. Yes. But it's hard because yeah, I'm equally curious. Yes. And just want to like oh hack away for a weekend and like see what happens. Yes. Well, ha- what's the last thing you've hacked on? Uh, I put something out this week. This oh. is like auto transcribing podcast. Oh, that's right. And you put some hacker news. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Which. Speaking of unit economics, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I might be like committing the mortal sin of like oh, no. selling a dollar for 80 cents. Uh, oh, because you still have a uh, human doing it, to yeah. fixing like the little stuff. Yeah. Got it. So I have to figure out like either full time employees or uh, Mechanical Turk, which I've never gotten good results from mm-hmm. uh, at scale. Scale actually like at a scale a little bit larger than we're at right now. Mm-hmm. I could have someone full time like oh. fixing podcasts. Yeah, um, but right now it's a lot of like Craig waking up at five in the morning and being like, doop, 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 doop. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't cost me anything because I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> I've like created my own five dollar an hour job. <laughs> so dumb. Okay. Raise prices. Yeah, this is what I you can always raise prices. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a fear that I personally like have but should be okay with breaking yeah um because i didn't yeah i knew that uh if i started too high i wouldn't get enough customers Mm -hmm. fortunately i didn't give away any free demos if i gave away free demos and because we hit one on hn Mm -hmm. and if we were doing free demos it would have been a disaster yeah this is this is a very actually classical um error not to pounce on you or anything but i mean i did it myself at home joy too which is to get the first few users in the door People tend to want to discount, yeah. um, and then what you haven't done yet, but is that you continue discounting, and then all of a sudden you have a stream of just the worst kind of users because the people that come in just because of the discount are super value driven. Mm. So they want the cheapest thing, and they want the ten star service <laughs> for what you can only provide at maximum as a five star service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and they always drive the most customer service costs and it's just a big headache. Um, so it's good. It's, it's maybe okay to get the first few in because I mean, what they're hopefully also giving you in return is a lot of feedback. So right. you're improving on the experience and stuff like that. But at some point you definitely don't want to be scaling that. Uh, uh definitely uh, not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's only like a couple handful right now. So it's like totally fine. Um, but I mean, I just honestly didn't know if people wanted it. And Mm. that's why I was like, this will be an easy way to find out. Uh, It turns out they do. And it's a lot of work. Yes. Podcasting is getting really popular. It's crazy. And the need to edit a lot of them is 
pretty high too. Yeah, no, well, we were doing the, not to make this the Craig podcast, no. but uh, uh, we were doing the um, text-based audio editor for a while and I found that I was using it a little bit and I was using the other ones like Descript and, and there are mm-hmm. some competitors, mm-hmm. um, but I'm still so much more proficient in Premiere, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, I still wanted transcripts. Yes. And so I was like, this is a product I want. Yes. And yeah, it turns out. So the idea is it's a transcripts and then you can also edit it based on the transcripts like we've killed oh, you've moved that one. we've killed okay. the editing yeah um because it's really interesting on the technical side um but yeah like i said like it wasn't the product that i needed anymore right. got it okay. um which is i'm a little rare because i do video as well okay um but yeah yeah it's a lot more helpful like when you put it on the blog that there is a transcript there as yeah. well to follow and look back on and yeah. probably to search through as well i imagine yeah so it's kind of it's multifaceted so it's like seo mm-hmm. for sure uh, sharing because it, we can generate little quotes and stuff. Uh, some people only read podcasts, yes. which is like as personally is like an affront, <laughs> <laughs> but that's fine. Are uh, you a two X listener? No, two, two, really? I've done it before, but I was like, <laughs> I, I used to do it. And then I realized I was talking faster Yes, because I mean, we've talked about this before, but like you and I were like, be at home all day and not talk to someone. <laughs> so I, was like, I, I had a moment where I was like, I've only listened to podcasts today. And I'm at a coffee shop talking to the po- like the host at like 2x speed. <laughs> yeah, there's, if you listen, if all you do all day is just listen to things at 2x and then you go talk to somebody, you, you, you always wonder, it's like, why are you talking so slow? They're talking normal speed, but yeah. it's like you are talking unbearably slow right now. Speed yeah. up. <laughs> I've actually uh, met a couple podcasters in person after I was listening to them at uh-huh. 2x speed. I was like, oh my God, you're so <laughs> slow. And then you get really used to listening to podcasters. So you know it like uh, Joe Rogan. I've heard so many of his episodes mm-hmm. that I basically like know the anecdote that's coming up. Yeah. And so I'm like, skip, <laughs> skip, skip. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. happening. Uh, but anyway, yeah, podcasting is awesome. Uh, TBD, how much money there is in it. Mm, yes. Because it's all like content marketing or a lot of content marketing right now. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, next question. Um, CMAC F, I'm not going to pronounce that last name, uh, asks, what are the best practices when uh, reaching out cold to an investor? Really easy. Keep it short. Um, say what you want to say. If you can do it in two to three sentences and then ask a specific question, which is, can we get not, which is not, can we get coffee, <laughs> which is actually something that they can answer and actually help you with. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that that investor would never meet with you. It's just, you have to remember these investors are getting lots of these emails and they're also need like their job is to take meetings mm-hmm. from people that are interviewing them. So all these warm intros. And so you just need to figure out a way to develop a relationship with that person. And one way is just to have a back and forth over email over time. Yeah. And then when it becomes interesting enough, basically when I get to the point where I'm writing three or four paragraphs back, I'm like, okay, never mind. Let's just get either get on the phone or meet in person because this has now gotten to the point where I'd like to actually talk to you for a, a long bit. Yeah. And also investors hang out on the same sites that hackers hang out on and like product people hang out on. So if you're out there making stuff, you can get attention. Oh yeah. On yeah, Reddit, Hack News, all these places. Yeah. They're all there. They're like they hang out on Product Hunt. It's like you don't have to just like pretend that only email is a way to get their attention. <laughs> yes, I agree. Uh, because I, th- this is like one of those things that's like you you make up these like little excuses for yourself where like Adora didn't reply to my email. It's never going to work out. And you're like, that's just cheating. Right. I yeah. agree. Totally. Uh, all right. Next question uh, from a name with a bunch of emoji in it. <laughs> I think it says Riley Soros. Yeah. Uh, they uh, they ask, is Uber for X still a thing uh, people would invest in in the U.S.? So I definitely think so. I mean, we've seen the scooter craze going on now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that I, when I think about Uber for X, I think it's push a button and a bunch of logistically hard operational things happen in the back. And then you get a product and service like within a few seconds, a few minutes, within a day or something like that. Um, and that to me shouts convenience and i think a lot of people want convenience that's something people want yeah and so i think there's always products and services to be built in the uber for x realm yeah um and i think that yes there's definitely less overall less money being put into it than say four to five years ago but and that's a result of 
uh, investors um, understanding and learning about what these business models look like, the fact that they're pro- most of these businesses grow a little bit slower so that you can build up a great user experience. Yeah. Um, and understand they understand the unique economics much better as well. Yeah. Um, and so there's, I would say, not as much hype, but there's certainly, if you're growing um, and you have good retention and good engagement, uh, you certainly can probably get funded. Has there been a, a large success that was kind of like a follow-on company in this way? Like where kind of like a copycat or just like a derivative? Mm. I'm trying to think. What's of an what? example? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to, I mean, example. you know, like, uh, well, so using the Uber for X example, then mm. you just like, oh, we're going to, you know, make this thing because it's just like Uber. Oh, I mean, when Uber came out, there were a lot of these like Uber for cookies and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> these like I know there are a million like failures. I've been to yeah. a hackathon before. Oh, we're you looking for a success. Yeah. Um, I mean, there. I, I would group all this into kind of the, the sharing economy stuff yeah. as well. Um, so, if you look at mobility, there's cars, bikes, scooters now, um, e-bikes. Mm-hmm. Um, Outside of that, let's see. Uh, there's, um, yeah, I, that's a good question. Not, for some reason, nothing jumps in my mind. Um, I'm sure it exists, it. but I think it's just not like a dominant player, like yes. something massive. Yeah, I don't, th- I can't think of anything massive except for, let's see, let's, if we go to Asia and China, um, all the food delivery stuff is rocking and rolling there. Same here, actually. I mean, there's Uber yeah. Eats and DoorDash. Um, so I think that's working well. There's some storage companies that may do well. Um, but yeah, yeah. There's mm. not, nothing to the... I mean, if we try to compare it to Uber, I think it's going to be very hard. Right. But in, actually, I'm... Yeah, I'm still wrong. Because like Google wasn't the first search engine. So it's definitely not about being yes. first. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. So yeah, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next question is uh, Fedor Peretsky. They ask, has YC's views or have YC's views changed on cryptocurrency blockchain related startups since Coinbase um, and their Coinbase is YC company? Right. So um, has it changed? I think we've we've learned a lot more just because um, there's more activity in the space. Yeah. I think every partner probably has a different viewpoint of it. Um, for me personally, I'm super excited about what's going on. Um, I think in general, people should be general should be excited when a lot of smart people are working on something diligently. Um, and um, I think there's there's a lot of uh, tools and stuff like that still to be built um, for this to take off. But if I try to like game out how far this could go, I just think the possibilities are limitless. Um, so the thing that really excites, the stuff that excites me are when you look at countries, cities or countries in which there are um, bad currencies mm-hmm. um, or just bad financial infrastructure, I think these are obvious places where blockchain and crypto can help a lot and move them forward, mm-hmm. if not even leapfrog maybe other countries. Um, and then there's other, th- and then similarly in the, in those countries, usually there's also issues with like property rights and stuff like that. So I've talked to folks in Greece and places in South America where the concept of, of who owns land, like each piece of land Sorry. is, uh, <laughs> almost non-existent. It's somewhere in a drawer, maybe in pencil and paper, yeah. but even then who knows if that's real. And so I think if any of these countries or cities are serious about it, they could, leapfrog, you know, centralized services and just put it onto the blockchain. And um, wouldn't it be cool if you do that, not only, I, well, one is just identifying who owns property, like that would drive, I think, economic growth in itself, mm-hmm. um, because it would incentivize people to actually do stuff. Um, but on top of that is um, increasing the number of transactions that can happen. So even in America, trying to buy property or exchange property is extremely hard. It's extremely expensive. And it, seem, it seems to be unnecessarily so. Um, and so anyway, I think like land registries is an example of something I would be super excited about to see happen. Is that the uh, DAP you're building? No. I, what I'm building is just something very simple. I'm not, uh, yeah. Is it just like, the, uh, <laughs> it's like you're sending, building a blog? <laughs> it's like the yeah, yes, Python almost, tutorial? <laughs> almost exactly that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> sending myself fake tokens. I mean, it's on the, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Um, but... 
the the thing that comes to mind for me with crypto and blockchain is um, I think there's a lot of skepticism because of what's being built right now. But I actually think that what's being built now is are the right things being built um, in the sense that one, um, there, are, there it's such a new technology mm-hmm. um, that there are still so many issues, potential security issues and putting the wrong types of smart contracts on there. And um, and so now you see a slew of consultants and also companies doing security audits. And we've just invested in a couple of companies that are building AI to help um, uh, ensure um, better security and ensure that the economies don't go out of whack and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, and so I think um, doing playful things and building playful apps um, is actually the right way to help develop the ecosystem because you don't want... I think super serious things on there without all of this stuff being built already. Right. Um, uh, one of the things that we talked about earlier uh, was I think it's super. I think for this to go anywhere as well, we need UX people and yeah. product people. Um, right now, it is just way too hard for s- somebody to use these DApps. You know? Do you know what the DAUs for DApps are? Uh, Try to guess. Uh, I'm guessing it's really small. Yeah. Um, 10,000. Wow. Okay. That was pretty good. Okay. <laughs> I don't know the exact number now, but the last time I read it, it was like around 10,000. Really? Right. Yeah, 10, yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, I just know like how, how much of a pain in the ass MetaMask is. Yes. And, you're and like, you got to install it and then you got to, you know, move money to it and, and all this stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think that needs to be solved before this goes mainstream. And I, But the, the nice thing is all these things are solvable. Yeah. Um, it just needs to be built, mm-hmm. and with due time, it'll, it'll be built. And we're more than happy to help accelerate this by investing in startups who are building this stuff. Um, and the other thing is also, I think, more of a PR and branding thing. I just think the word mm. blockchain has been thrown around so many times that people don't fully understand what it means. For sure. Um, and so there's a bit of an education. I sort of think that when it goes mainstream, we don't need to use the word blockchain per se. Um, just like we don't use the word database to explain Facebook. Yeah. No, like my my parents don't know what Ajax is. Yeah. It's not important. Yes, exactly. (laughs) You just need to tell them what it does. Yeah. 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 It's, it's ultimately it's the product. Yes. Uh, but I think with like, with so many smart people working on it, it seems highly unlikely that something won't come out of it. Yeah. Um, To hope. So, uh, cool. Probably related to, uh, that question. Uh, Manav asks, what type of companies is YC uh, seeing more of uh, for this batch? Hmm. We've seen a lot more applications on the crypto and blockchain front. Yeah. Um, so super excited about that. Uh, we continue to see more and more applications on AI, machine, in particular machine learning and deep learning, and the applications for it across so many fields now. Um, and so that's exciting. Um I don't think we've seen anything where we've seen complete automation yet of anything really. Um, but it's kind of cool that we're building tools and stuff like that to help mm-hmm. doctors, people in the field doing work and stuff like that. And what else are we seeing? Biotech, we're seeing lots of those, which is exciting. Um, particularly the intersection of software and biology. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also we just launched our YC bio program, which is um, which all the companies go through the three month program that, that all the other startups go through. Um, but it's targeted towards people who, or companies that are still in the lab research yeah. phase. And so the, and so we're, and we're focused on what's some sub area right now, which is health span and longevity. Um, and so we've seen a lot of those and we're really excited about that. Do you have a strong opinion on how long you think you're going to live? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I hope for a long time. Um, I would like to live over a hundred, I guess. Okay. Um, or whatever the current life expectancy expectancy is, which is lower than a hundred. Like seventy eight or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I try to do all the things to make sure mm-hmm. I'm healthy um, and sane. Um, but I've, you know, I don't, I don't do any drugs or anything to make yeah. myself go. <laughs> no uh, caloric restriction. Oh, so, um, I mean, I've tried doing that and I didn't notice any specific change, um, other than like a little bit of weight loss. Yeah. 
Um, but I actually go back and forth on that a little bit, um, trying it out. Oh, really? So, so I do the whole, um, like I've done th- in three, six month spans, um, the whole 18, yeah. like don't eat for 18 hours. Um, and, and that actually like the first week is kind of hard. It's just like probably any diet you go on. It's like the first week is kind of hard, but it's actually pretty simple. Yeah. Um, and I haven't done the whole fast for like 48 hours thing though. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it's fine. Like you, you feel better. You, you feel fine. <laughs> you get used to it. I mean, the first, like by the end of the first day, mm-hmm. you really are starting to get hungry and then you push through it and then you could go like another day or two and be totally fine. Mm. Um, I mean, but also my body fat isn't like 1%. Right. So maybe if I was like that skinny, yeah. it would be different. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm similar to you. Like I've tried everything out. I know when I do the the intermittent fasting or whatever, I can be leaner. Yes. Uh, but the selling point is that you, you're going to live longer, right? So it's just like hard to feel a difference. And like ultimately with all this stuff, I'm, I'm just kind of like, man, you, you got to live. Yeah. Like, I really yeah. want, want to hang out with my friends and like have a beer. And Correct. Like, yeah. So uh, I also want to make it to 100 over, <laughs> but like, I, I don't know. We'll see. We got some time. Yeah. I want to make it pretty far and still have an active mind. I think that's yeah. probably most important for most people is just um, having an active mind still. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like the the further we can push the quality of life, mm-hmm. the happier we're going to be overall. Because yes. it's not really about like, yeah, a lot of people lose it well before 78. Right. So, cool. Uh, all right, next question. Uh, Yaha Elamrani asks, what are the best marketing strategies for a year one B2C startup? So, um, the best ones are always the unpaid ones. Uh, I think... I mean, this is almost a cop out, but if you build a product that people love, they're going to talk about it. And that's the best way to grow. Um, I think tactically speaking, there are other things you can do. Um, content marketing, which you're an expert in, so maybe you can talk more about that. Um, and there are all the tactical things. If you're, if you're a consumer product, um, and they're, if the people are coming to your website and no one's signing up or anything, yeah. you know, one of the things that this is, seems like counterintuitive, advice but is to just put a phone number on there Hmm. um and uh people still want to call people still like to talk to people surprise (laughs) i i Um, never um installed the drift or intercom on a product until last year people use it all the time yeah i mean it should be obvious because it's like successful company yes they use it all the time yep yeah so having a chat on there putting a phone number on there um it's a it's actually a good thing because if no one's signing up, at least you can talk to these people and mm-hmm. figure out what it is that they want or what's going wrong. Um, so finding just easy ways for people to contact you is also another way. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would ditto the content marketing. I would say don't waste your time if you're not going to make something good mm. because it's, it's really easy to get on the, the content marketing treadmill mm-hmm. and be like, oh man, we just got to like bang out this stuff, yeah. put something out every week. Yeah. And, and if you look at like the the analytics on YC content, mm-hmm. it's like a power law mm-hmm. with like the the stuff that gets the most attention right. uh, is definitely not linear. Mm-hmm. And and even just the things I'm sure with you as well, like the things you work on, yeah. what like people talk to you about, you're yeah. like, dude, I did that article in like two days, and then, like, <laughs> like, three years later, you're talking to me about this thing. Um, the ones with the least amount of effort get the most views. It's crazy. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, maybe you should just write like silly, pithy tweets and, <laughs> and be a thought leader. Yeah. <laughs> Do lists still work well? Because one of the top posts is that um, essential advice list uh, thing, I think. Yeah, that, that works well. Um, the, I mean, we couldn't replicate that mm-hmm, sure. uh, essential YC advice post because that was an aggregation of posts over time. Uh, people like lists, people like book lists. Mm. Um, but you also want to think like, why are the people even reading it? Like we can, with with a lot of our content, we could get more attention by interviewing like YouTube celebrities, but to what end? <laughs> yeah. I, I was talking to someone who watches the channel uh-huh. and they were like, oh, that's cool. Like, I like all your like science and tech videos. Like, what's Y Combinator? And it's like, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> um, so, 
you, if you're like not getting them all the way through the door, it's yeah, especially when you're tiny and like you don't have a full time person making stuff. Yes. Um, so yeah, I would just figure out like what actually works for you and mm-hmm. like focus on doing a good job of it mm-hmm. rather than just mailing it in. Sure. Because yeah. that that stuff is I've never had luck with. Yeah. Do, do you think that it's articles that work best? I guess maybe it's depending on the product or do you think podcasts, videos, like what form, what medium works well? Yeah. Um, I think people still undervalue uh, the ability to write clearly. Mm. There aren't that many people that can write well. So if you can get someone who can write well specifically in a niche uh, and then get a channel to engage with it like HN, Mm -hmm. you can get a ton of traffic Mm. because people can consume the entirety for the most part consume the entirety of the content Mm -hmm. whereas with the podcast like you have to be like a hardcore like podcaster Mm -hmm. or youtuber youtuber works pretty well or youtube works pretty well when we cut it up into clips right right. but if you look at the retention like it's like anything like there's a huge amount of drop off right whereas with the the articles it's easier to do right um but i i find like i don't always have a great thing to write about Mm mm-hmm and the podcast is a much easier way to like keep consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, Are there, not to make this into a podcast about content marketing, but yeah, yeah, this yeah. is uh, to me intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. Are there like blogs or um, like what companies do you feel like do content marketing really well? Mm. I would break it apart into different like categories. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I think like not to, uh, you know, blow YC's like on trumpet, but I think PG did a great job. Oh, I think yes, like YC is yeah. actually like one of the best content marketing companies ever, mm-hmm. except they would never say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like HN and PG essays are content marketing. Sure. Um, I think on the companies, I think like uh, 37 Signal, uh, Basecamp does a mm-hmm. really good job. Those guys have like established themselves as like thought leaders, but also make content that's pretty relevant. Mm-hmm. And they're... Um, they're gutsy enough to have an opinion, mm-hmm. whereas a lot of people aren't. Sure. Um, Strong opinions yeah. matter and probably get more views. For yeah. Sure. yeah, especially when it's contrarian, mm-hmm. right? So they like they exist in the software space, but they've like pushed pretty hard to be kind of independent. Yeah. Um, in a similar way, like indie hackers did quite well mm-hmm. for that. So I think that like that Stripe acquisition made mm-hmm. a lot of sense mm-hmm. um, because people connect to Cortland. Sure. Um, I think uh, yeah, Intercom has done a really good job. Um, but I, I mean, honestly, like I pay attention to uh, a lot of people on YouTube because mm-hmm. I think like for the most part, like Silicon Valley still doesn't understand how big it is oh, yeah. and like the, just the amount of like pure traffic and consumption. It's a rabbit hole. It's insane. I found myself watching some weird videos after two or three hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> you're, yeah. Just, you're just like one after the next, after the next, after yeah. the next. And you're like, so we did a podcast with, um, Casey Neistat. Mm-hmm. And like he gets more views a week than almost any TV show. And you're just like, what? This guy like rides a boosted board around. And, like, <laughs> and then you find out that he's like representing a significant percentage of boosted sales. Mm. Just this one dude in New York. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's super talented. Yeah. And that's like a lifetime of work and yep. a ton of creative energy. Yep. Um, but it works really well. Like mm-hmm. if you can find someone like that. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, and I, I think also, but then like on the SEO side, like I think Nerd Wallet has done a great job. Oh right, like they have all of those like best credit card type things, mm-hmm. and it's not like spammy. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we did a whole content marketing podcast actually. Oh, we should uh, link with, to it. with uh with it's um, in the link if you look. Yeah, first round and Andrews and Horowitz. <laughs> oh cool. Yeah. yeah. So we're like. Oh, that's right. I listened to that. That's good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, next question. Um, Yaha Elamrani asks. What would you say to a founder from a third world country where there is a big lack in tech talents and you can't compete with big corporations due to a lack of resources in terms of hiring? So the way to always get around this is to seem more exciting than these big corporations. Um, And one way is if you're technical, is to just build the product yourself and start getting users. Mm -hmm. And when you start growing and you start getting revenue, um, you can probably go poach these people. Uh, I always think that in a big company, there's always like a fellow entrepreneur in there yeah. <laughs> somewhere, totally. stuck somewhere. Yeah, totally. um, and enough, but if you're not, if you're not technical, it's a little bit harder, but there are enough SaaS tools out there these days where like Weebly and all these things where you can just patch together, I think something and get something out there and iterate a bit to the point 
where you can also get users yeah. and um, and revenue. Um, and I even see today like engineers, like real engineers, they're sort of embarrassed to do it, but they have to do it. And they'll just like put up a Shopify site first. Yeah. Um, and they totally hate it because they're like, I can do this much better if I can customize it myself. But <laughs> I don't have to pay the fees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in reality, like that's how you're going to get your first few users quickly. Um, totally. Is doing that. And so once you do that, then again, you can go through the same cycle of trying to go find people to um, join you yeah. um, with something that looks exciting. Yeah. I, I mean, I would encourage people with, with like sales aptitudes mm -hmm. to get people to pay them. Yes. Because if you're good at sales, you're probably good at convincing people to think that your product is good before mm -hmm. it exists. Yep. And only once they give you money do you know yes. they really want it. Yes. Yeah. I've made that mistake before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Aspiring Angel asks, what's the best way for investors interested in startup uh, Cedar Angel funding to get started? And how does location affect that process? Um, so... I think these days it's really easy to get started. I think one place you can go is we have a startup investor school that we held um, a few weeks back that um, one of the partners here, Jeff Ralston, did an amazing program with it. It's all on YouTube. And it's all on YouTube. Yep. Yeah. And so I would watch all of those um, a couple times. Um, and then another thing to do is there are, like we said earlier, there's a lot, lot of online communities where people are making things. Mm -hmm. And so it's just start hanging out there and talking to founders um, and seeing how they think. Um, and more importantly, if not most importantly, is using the products mm -hmm. um, and figuring out, you know, developing hypotheses on, is this going to get big? How could this get big? You know, where could this go? Um, and then finally, just contacting the founders. I think founders, especially when they're starting off, no one's really talking to them that much. <laughs> no. And so, um, I think if you reach out to them, uh, I think some of them, some percentage of them will be more than happy to start talking to you. Yeah. What about when you um, you start talking to a founder and say you're, say you're even talking to a YC founder um, and you feel like the price is high? Mm. I would say is if you're, start, if you're doing early stage investing, price should not be really an issue because... In venture business, it's the exit that counts, mm -hmm. um, and I don't. And you shouldn't be investing, I think, um, in a company that you don't think is actually going to do well to whatever standard it is. Like it doesn't have to be a billion dollars, but you know, to whatever standard you want it to be. Um, and honestly, like at the end of the day, valuation is supply and demand, and that is what drives some of those valuations. Um, and so sometimes you just have to pay up to get involved. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Last question. So, Adora, you've been at YC now for two and a half years, roughly. Uh, how has your view of uh, startups and the world in general changed since then? Um, so, despite all the uh, horrible stories in the news, <laughs> um, I have actually become much more optimistic about life and the world and startups in general. Um, I think, you know, we are at, we're at YC, we're sitting in a pretty privileged position of being able to spend a lot of our time thinking about problems, um, talking with founders who are trying to solve these problems, and then seeing all these new cool technologies mm -hmm. um, that they're creating um, that I certainly couldn't do myself. And so I think when I think about if just some of these people do well, like the world can change yeah, for the better. Um, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I'm just optimistic, I guess, more optimistic. But what about yourself? Uh, I'm in complete agreement. I mean, I think that it's like, it's too easy if you read the news to believe that everything is black and white. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there are, I didn't quite realize it until I was at YC that like people want to treat Silicon Valley broadly and YC specifically as kind of like the Yankees. <laughs> and so it sort of it sort of doesn't matter what you do. Uh, they're always going to be like haters out there. But um, seeing people come in like specifically when they're just like they're they're building, you know, like um, like artificial wombs and mm -hmm. like all this crazy stuff. Mm -hmm that's going to be the future mm -hmm. and it's super exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I mean, my personal strategy is to just like not pay attention to stuff yeah. and like talk to people who are building things. Yeah. You know what is really is somewhat indicative of this is the scooters because the scooters, <laughs> 
I like when I got on one, I fell in love with it. And I just, really? like, yeah, I just like this, this could change mobility within a city, not just scooters, but bikes and Uber and all these other, an AV and stuff like that. Um, but then when it started taking off, people just started making fun of it. They're right. like, what is this San Francisco thing and like ruining everything? Um, and everyone looks like dorks riding them. But then, but then, then those, the critics, I think, started, some of them anyway, I think, started yeah. riding these scooters and they're like, oh, it's actually like, I, I can see, mm-hmm. I can see why this could be a thing. Um, and so just by, using it and being part of it. Um, and so I think there are some of these barriers maybe we, that are that are dropping. Well, um, I think a lot of companies and products have done a, a, a bad job at making people feel included. Because yes, I think I that agree. people react strongly when they feel like they don't have any agency. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's ironically, right, like people will be tweeting something about how terrible something in Silicon mm-hmm. Valley is and how people are terrible. And then you meet the people here and they're just like, I don't know, I just like want to make something cool. Yeah. Like, yes. So there's this very weird divide yes. that that's kind of just in people's heads. Yes. And I think in this day and age, it's everyone's responsibility yeah. to know, to, to at least try to predict the reaction of anything you put out there. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the world is the world is you know at at where it is now for better or worse yeah. um and so it's just being very thoughtful of what you put out there is it's actually important yeah totally i mean yeah overwhelmingly positive and i think uh technology is much bigger than uh, a little app on your phone yes uh, so <laughs> keeping that in mind i think it keeps you excited yes yes cool all right well uh, thanks so much for making time thank you so much had fun